Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Christoph Pettis. I'm very pleased because this is the first conference where I've had a ligature in my first name because of the font they're using. I feel very special with that. Um, I'm with a company called PostgreSQL Experts. Um, we are a small Postgres consultancy in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we're actually in Alameda, California, which is a little island floating in the bay. Um, email address, that is my personal blog. The slides will be up there. Uh, there's my Twitter account. And so what are we going to talk about today? Um, PostgreSQL can handle databases of any size. Um, the largest one I personally worked on was multiple petabytes, and that's on community PostgreSQL. It's also on 8.1. I hope, no one's, uh, I hope no one's still on 8.1. Um, so what we're going to talk about, though, is how you handle Postgres changes as the database gets larger. Because what works on a small one does not work on a large one. And you frequently face scaling challenges as the database grows. Um, so what wor works for a 1 gigabyte database does not work for a 10 terabyte database. So let's talk about that. Um, again, that's my personal blog. That's where the slides will be. And we're going to use uh, main series stars as a metaphor here. So your basic database is a 10 gigabyte database, sort of where everybody's first database, you know, my first database is nice little 10 gigabytes. The nice part about PostgreSQL is it's very hard to go wrong with a 10 gigabyte database. Nearly everything will run fast. And even pathological joins, even a cross join, unless it's a fully n squared database uh, join, across a, large, uh, a couple of large tables will perform very well. This is both a blessing and a curse because when you start out, everything seems to run fast and as the database gets larger and larger, at some point you're surprised when things no longer work well. Um, you can even run this on the stock PostgreSQL.com. You don't even have to change shared buffers or anything. Everything will work just fine. Um, so how much memory do you need for a database this size? Well, if you can't fit your 10 gigabyte production database in memory, you probably need to reconsider your life choices. Um, you can just spin up a 10 gigabyte instance and stuff the whole thing into memory and you're done. Um, even micro instances on your favorite cloud provider can handle a 10 gigabyte database, so you're fine. Um, even sequential scans will zip right along on a database of this size. So, any real database has to be backed up. You do not truly possess anything that is not backed up, backed up off-site. Um, just use PGDump. It works fine. You're done. Um, on my laptop, a five gigabyte database takes about 90 seconds to back up using PGDump in custom format. And that's not even in parallel mode. That's just in old style sequential mode. So it works just fine. You don't need anything more sophisticated on a database of this size. And just stick the backup files in cloud storage, you know, S3, B2, whatever you like, and you're done. It's very easy. Um, let's say this 10 gigabyte database is in fact a production critical database and you want high availability. Um, you can achieve this on something this size. Just have a primary and a streaming secondary using binary streaming replication. You don't need anything more fancy. Um, you use direct streaming or just wall archiving. In this case, manual failover may be what you want. You don't just you know, get the pager goes off, you sleepily roll out of bed at three in the morning, promote the secondary, and go back to bed. To tune, you know, what, what do you do to tune a database this size? Well, if you insist. There's really not much tuning to do. Um, the usual memory-related parameters. Um, there, if you have an all-in-memory uh, all database, and it's going to stay this way for a while, um, there, are some, there is some specific tuning you can do. So I don't want people to feel like there's no information in this talk. So, ta-da, tuning. Um, I, use the, I use this kind of tune uh, set up for a database where it's largely going to fit entirely in memory. Um, it j seems to generate pretty um, good plans for that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, set sequential page cost to 0.1, random page cost to 0.1, CPU tuple cost 0.03, shared buffers to 25% of memory. There's almost never a reason to go beyond that on shared buffers. Interestingly enough, I've done all kinds of measurements on shared buffers, and I'm never barely able to get any performance difference on any setting. So, the people agonize over whether shared buffers should be uh, 16 or 15 gigabytes. It's like, you're, don't worry, it's fine. Um, 
Set work mem to 16 megabytes because that's what it should be for everybody. Maintenance work mem to a reasonable value. You're done, easy. Oh, right, and turn on logging. It's one of the, the few, one, um, just tur turn on lots of logging because it'll be very helpful as the database grows to see what's going, uh, going wrong. Unless you're on RDS, in which case you don't have access to most of this stuff and that, that's, I'm sorry. Um, okay, upgrading a small database. Just do a dump restore, easy, you're done. See, problem solved. But do it. Um, because the farther you fall behind on major versions in Postgres, the harder it becomes to upgrade. Um, the, I think the most important thing about upgrades is that they shouldn't be a surprise. Always plan your upgrade strategy. What I like to tell people is when version X comes out, um, if you're on version X, when version X plus one comes out, start planning your upgrade. So when X plus two comes out, you're ready to do the upgrade. Where you end up with the multiple petabyte database on 8.1 is you kind of kick the can down the road, as the saying goes. And ultimately, and because and every new version, it becomes a little harder to upgrade. So just make, understand you will have to upgrade and start planning your strategy. If you start doing this when your database is 10 gigabytes, it will be much easier when it's much larger. Okay, so your database has grown. Now it's 100 gigabytes. It's not huge, that's not what I would call a huge database, but it's starting to get bigger than will fit into memory. This is kind of the first inflection point in a database where the whole thing can't be squeezed into RAM. And this is where queries will start performing poorly, where the queries that worked great, um, you know, that, that <clears throat> um, these 12 page long queries with five CTEs and you know, of, 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 at a lateral join against a function call, and these queries that you were incredibly proud of that ran really, really fast on a small database and suddenly are coming apart, this is where this starts happening. Um, at this point, um, PG dump backups might start taking too long to either take or restore. Um, dumping, dumping and restoring a 500 gigabyte database is not the fastest thing in the world. So how much memory? Do you need? This is the question we were, were, I'm asked all the time is, by clients is, so I have an XQ, how much memory should we have? And the answer, it's, there's no really easy answer to this because it depends on the workload and a lot of other things. But if you fit the whole thing in memory, great. 100 gigabytes, it's still quite practical to fit this in memory. Getting a 128 gigabyte instance is no big deal. Um, Otherwise, a good rule of thumb is try to squeeze the top one to three largest indexes into memory, because if you can't do that, then the database really is getting very large, and it's time to start thinking of other strategies. Um, as, a, as a very um, quick rule of thumb, you want to be able to set effective cache size larger than the largest index. So if your largest index is, say, 12 gigabytes, you want to make sure you have at least well, you know, what would be that, 14, 15 gigabytes of memory? Um, so, because um, the planner will like that if you do that, and the planner will reward this. Now, more memory is always better. You know, no one, no one gets up and no one looks at a system and says, the real problem with this machine is it has too much RAM. Um, but remember that more memory doesn't help write performance on Postgres. In fact, very large shared buffer values can hurt, can be, can hurt write performance by take, causing checkpoints to be larger. And at this point, PG backup, pro, PG dump probably won't cut it anymore. Um, both because the dumps and restores will take a long time and the risk of data loss is much, much higher because you, there's only so frequently you can d dump a database this size. So it's time to do PTR backups. Um, I personally like PG backrest a lot as a, as a backup tool. Um, there's also Wall-E if you're using cloud storage for, um, for your backups. There's also Barman. There's um, quite a few backup tools out there that are specifically designed for Postgres. If you must roll your own, I would strongly encourage you not to do this. Please use a package product. Backups on po PT PITR backups on Postgres are re remarkably subtle in the number of ways they can go wrong. These tools have spent a lot of work um, finding, finding and plugging those holes. Um, it's not suicidal to roll your own, but understand that, there, that it's, not, it's not as easy as it may look. So, 
Um, a PITR backup takes the, um, you take an entire file system copy plus wall archiving. Um, more frequent file system copies means that you can restore faster, but you have to do this large copy every time you do that. You can play, you can um, do delta backups and things like that, uh, so, which can accelerate it, but ultimately you are going to be copying a lot of files. There are lots and lots of backup, um, advantages to a PITR backup. You can restore to a point in time, thus the name. So if you need to restore to 10 a.m. yesterday from a backup that was taken at 10 a.m. this morning, you can do that, assuming you have all the right ahead log segments. Um, and you can use the backup to prime new secondaries, which is very, very handy. Um, it's time to get rid of that old everything fit in memory tuning. Um, sequential page costs generally back to 1.0. Random page costs between 0.5 and 2.0, depending on um, what kind of storage subsystem you're using. Um, for example, who's, who's running on RDS or, or a similar kind of highly cloud environment with a SAN kind of thing? Goes up a little bit every year in Europe, although not nearly as fast as the US. Um, I generally recommend random page costs of 1.1 for EBS or that, kind of, or that kind of highly shared SAN server because there's no such thing as a sequential page from EBS because you're mixing it up with 5,000 other clients on that same disk. Um, so shared buffers, still 25% of memory, and maintenance work mem, higher, but don't go crazy with that. Um, work mem. The, work mem for a long time was like the consultant's retirement program. You would, come, someone would come in and say all our queries are running slow, you'd kick work mem up a little bit, all the queries are running fast, you'd be a hero. It, would be, it was great, easy money. Um, base work mem on the actual temporary files being created in the logs. This is a hard parameter to set without actual experience on what you're doing. Um, and just set it to two or three times largest file. Um, now, of course, if you are running a data warehouse and it's creating 23 gigabyte temporary files, you may not be able to crank it to two or three times that, in which case you will have to make some trade-offs, speed versus performance, um, memory trade-offs. Um, of course, the best thing to do is if you are creating huge temporary files, fix the queries that are creating them. Now, if you can't fix them, you can accept it for low frequency queries or start thinking about more memory. Data warehouses can be very, very memory intensive to get good performance. Um, at this point, your traffic is probably getting to the point that you will need to think about load balancing. So consider moving to read traffic to streaming secondaries. Um, that's, what, well, that's something they're very good for. Um, be aware that um, on, a, on any, any replication technology, you will have replication lag, unless you switch everything to synchronous replication, at which point you've destroyed your performance, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, and it's um, ideally you want to handle the traffic balancing in the app. You, so under the app itself understands what a read where what it can direct to read secondaries and what it needs to direct to the primary for writes. Um, if you can't, well, there's PG Pool. Um, it's a, you know it, it's there and it will do the traffic uh, division for you. Although it's kind of quirky. At this point, you're running a real system and you should think about real monitoring. Um, at the absolute minimum, you should process logs through PG Badger from our friends at the Libo. Thank you very much for this tool. It's great. Um, uh, PG stat statements is very, very, very valuable. It makes sure it's install it, turn it on, query it regularly. It gives you lots of interesting information about uh, frequent queries. I, there's an external tool called PG Analyze. It's a hosted tool that queries your PG stat statements and a bunch of other stuff and produces nice, friendly graphics for you. I like it. I like it a lot. And you know, everybody has Postgres plugins at this point, New Relic, Datadog, et cetera. So it's time to start about the, but whatever you do, monitor, time to get real monitoring in place. Um, check PG Badger and PG stat statements regularly for slow queries or slower queries, unless of course your application is falling apart and you already know they're there. Um, if you're missing indexes, they will start becoming very apparent in databases of this size. Um, create the indexes as you need to, but don't just start slapping indexes on everything. This is a common ORM problem, where the ORM is managing the schema, because it makes it really easy to create a query. You just say, you know, if I'm a Django guy, so db index equals true. And 
there's this tendency to just set that, turn that on for everything. Well, I might query on this. I might need an index. Indexes are very, very expensive. They're expensive to create. They're expensive to maintain. Um, for example, I just as a test, did a bunch of inserts into a table with just a primary key and then a table with 14 indexes plus the primary key, and it was about 100 times slower. So don't create indexes, don't create indexes prospectively. Create them based on real workload. Okay, well, at this point, you're probably getting bored rolling out of bed every, with the pager going off at 3 in the morning. So um, it's time to start thinking about some kind of tooling for failover so you don't have to respond to the, the failover events immediate, uh, per, uh, manually. There's PG Pool 2. Again, it exists. It's very well established as a tool. Kind of quirky. Um, a, new, a new tool that is um, intended for use in cloud environments where, um, is Patroni. Um, it's, uh, it, there, it is not an out-of-the-box drop-in solution. It requires some scripting support, but it does do it, do the, it is a more modern solution to the failover problem. And of course, there are hosted solutions like Amazon RDS that take care of this for you. Okay, upgrades. Um, at this point, you're probably going to want to use PG upgrade um, rather than, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, rather than dump restore. It has the advantage that it's in, in play, you can run it in place. It, it, will, it will make it, allow you to do it as a copy, but everybody uses the link mode, which is an in place upgrade. It's very reliable and well tested. The only issue is there are some extensions that aren't a comfortable fit, especially for large major version jumps, um, like PostGIS can be a problem on PG upgrade. But if you're using largely stuff that's in the, in the, distribu the main distribution and contrib, you'll be fine. OK. Life, con you, life, life continues, and now you have a one terabyte database. OK, things kind of get real here. Um, you just can't buy, get enough memory anymore. I mean, no one's throwing, you know, yes, in theory you could, but v uh, one terabyte RAM machines are not a common solution to these problems. The queries are starting to fall apart more regularly. You this is the point that you should start running out of read capacity on the primary. And doing a full PITR backup just takes you long because you're throwing around one terabyte worth of data. Um, get as much memory as you can afford at this point. You, you will use it. Um, if you're building a data warehouse, it's going to need more memory than a transactional database because it'll be running larger queries and the working set will be much, much larger. And IO throughput becomes much more important. Um, consider moving to fast local storage from SAN-based solutions such as EBS around this size. Um, no matter how high performance your SAN-based solution is going to be, local MVME disks or things like that will be much faster. And this is a good time to start considering those kinds of transitions. Um, at this point, you'll need to start doing incremental backups instead of um, just copying the entire file system every time. Um, PG Backrest supports these. Um, you can roll your own with rsync, but this is an extra for experts kind of situation. Be sure you hit all the quirks involved in, a P in doing your own PITR backup. Um, at this point, you're probably going to, you will need to make sure that you have tuned checkpointing more because you're, um, the amount of stuff that's being written out each on each checkpoint is larger. So checkpoint completion target point nine, checkpoint timeout 15 minutes, more space for the wall, and turn on wall compression. You don't really need to bump up shared buffers beyond 16 to 32 gigabytes. Um, larger, uh, uh, larger values will increase the amount of d data it has to write on a checkpoint without much actual performance benefit. Um, and don't go crazy with maintenance work, mem. There is this tendency to just keep kicking it up on the theory that, well, it'll just make index creation and everything go faster. It, doesn't, it actually can be a, a, a negative effect above certain sizes. If you have really large indexes, it's often better to decrease it because of the way, um, because of the, the algorithm that it uses for building these. I've actually seen significant performance increases by dropping it from two gigabytes down to 512 megabytes. Load balancing becomes really important on a database this size because of the, the, presumably if it's one terabyte, that data came from somewhere, so you have a lot of things uh, working on the system. Um, at this point, you probably want to distinguish between a failover candidate, that's the machine that's designated to take over the load of the system once it begin, um, if the primary fails, and read replicas. Because 
there is a trade-off in Postgres on a binary replica. Something that's accepting a lot of queries will, by its nature, fall, start falling behind the primary. And you don't want that for the failover candidate. This is also a good time to start investing in infrastructure tooling. For example, having some kind of configuration as code mechanism for spinning up new secondaries, so that, um, to, rather than having to build everything manually. This is also a good time to think about offloading services if, this, if these crept into your architecture over time. For example, don't run analytic queries on the primary database, or even on a necessarily on a read secondary. Um, consider having a logical replica for analytics at this point. Uh, this is also a good time that if you have things like job queues and other kinds of high update rate, low retention period data items that are living in the primary database, it might be time to move them into Redis or something that's a little more suited for this kind of thing to get some to take some load off of the primary. Um, vacuum can start becoming an issue here. Um, increasing auto vacuum workers tends to not be very valuable unless you have a large schema in the sense of the number of database objects, because each worker can only work on one object at a time. So if you have the same, if you have 30 tables, doubling number of auto vacuum workers isn't going to get you much. One of the most important things to remember is, even though they're taking a long time, they need to complete. Don't start killing auto vacuum workers and then wondering why things are going wrong on your database. Um, this is, be careful with long running transactions that are blocking auto vacuum. And um, this is, um, there's nothing wrong with doing manual vacuums on tables that um, have very high update rates or similar kinds of patterns. Don't, auto vacuum is great, but you, it's not a, sim, a sign of failure if you feel you need to manually vacuum tables. Um, as, a, as a first pass, if auto vacuum is taking too long, consider reducing auto vacuum cost delay to make it uh, more aggressive. If it's causing capacity issues, on the other hand, like burning up too much I.O., consider decreasing it. If, um, if you're in a situation where it is both taking too long and using too much resources, get a more powerful machine already. Um, let, all, let it all vacuum run, but it's, you can get yourself into serious trouble, like your database will shut down on you level trouble if you, start, if you um, prevent it from completing. Indexes are really getting big on a database this big. Um, this is a good time to consider partial indexes for specific queries. Um, analyze which indexes are really being used and drop those that you're not really using. Look at PGStat user indexes for that. Um, queries can start becoming very problematic on a database this size. Even the best queries can take a long time to run against a much larger data set. So um, this is where you start seeing like index scan queries turning into bitmap index scan, bitmap heap scan queries um, around this size. One thing to consider at this point then is partitioning. Um, look for tables that can benefit from it. Time-based, you know, time-based partitioning for things that are time series, hash-based for tables that are large intrinsically like a customer's table. Um, Postgres 10 and 11 have a great um, partitioning functionality that um, much, much improved over the old style kind of hacked together partitioning. Um, and as lo make sure there's a strong partitioning key, and, uh, but definitely consider it. Um, this is a, also the size of a thing that really benefits from parallel query execution. So increase the number of workers and, the per, um, and per query parallelism. Um, it's very, this is great for queries that handle large result sets. Just make sure your I.O. capacity can keep up because you're about to throw a lot more parallel work at it. And if the, pr the previous problem was I.O. saturation, parallelizing the queries will not help because you'll just be, have more workers contending for the same saturated I.O. Um, this, this is also the point where you can, uh, statistics targets become important. Um, for fields with large numbers of values, the default can be too low. This is especially bad for long values like URLs because the, the, um, number, the, the, the amount of entropy is, tends to be like near the end of the string. Um, strings, UUIDs, stuff like that. So um, look for queries where a highly specific queries return a large number of rows. And a common pathology here is you do a, um, a query on a string value and you query for a specific URL and it says, well, I think 25% uh, of your table is going to come back from this query. And you know that's not true. Because it's, um, but the, because there are by default only 100 buckets of statistics, 
it, um, <clears throat> it results, the planner doesn't know that it's that specific. Um, just don't go crazy, don't, you know, set, don't set the default to 10,000 or anything because that can cause your analyze time to go way, way up, but find specific queries. Um, also consider using indexes that aren't B-trees. Um, like some fields are just not good matches for them. Um, range types, very um, long strings, for example, uh, are not great fits for B-trees because the entire value has to be propagated into the index. Um, for example, for long strings, hash indexes are very good, especially those where most of the entropy is like late in the string, like URLs or things like that. Um, PG upgrade still works fine because it's proportional number of database objects, not the amount of data. Um, but if the downtime is unacceptable, um, this is, um, you can do logical replication and rehoming, where you logically replicate to the new version and then rehome the application. Again, be sure to plan for major version upgrades. Um, you know, lest you be the one with the one petabyte database on Solon 8.1. Okay, 10 terabytes. This is big. This is a big database. You're, you're definitely in the large, big leagues now. You'll probably need to make some hard decisions for a database this size. Um, anything that involves just copying, using a copy tool, is going to become impractical with a database this size. Um, file system snapshots are a possibility at this point. I mean, ultimately, it has to be copied but you can start using more um, efficient mechanisms for doing so. You can use ZFS or SAN-based snapshots or things like that. One common thing that gets introduced at this point is table spaces. Um, people, you can, I can always tell a database that was originally set up by an Oracle DBA because it's like a five, terab a five gigabyte database with 18 table spaces because that was, that's Oracle. Oracle world is create a ton of table spaces. Um, don't do this. Table spaces are a pain in Postgres. They only use them if you have a, a, spe a specific reason that you must have a table space. For example, you're fast, slow storage, you're reaching the limits of a single volume and there's no way to expand the volume, things like that. Just under uh, understand that uh, table spaces significantly complicate backups and replication. Index bloat can become a significant problem at this size. It's much harder for Postgres to re recover space out of the middle of an index because it has um, then the heap because it has so much structure more structure. Um, at this point, you may need to start doing re-index uh, re or replace um, rebuild scripts. At this point, especially on very high up rate update, um, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, fields that have a very high update rate. Um, you're probably this is the time the databases kind of start running out of write capacity on the primary. Um, and th at this point, you probably, need, if you're starting to reach limits on write capacity, you need to start thinking about sharding. Um, you, can, there's, you can use a um, Citus, um, fine tool. Postgres XL, little more fiddly and um, a little more, little more user intervention required. Or you can design your own sharding. Um, so you, for example, geographic uh, sharding or, tenant, or some or multi-tenancy sharding. Um, this is very valuable for um, also to accelerate large data set uh, reads on large data sets by sharding them across. Um, just be prepared, there's going to be a lot more administrative complexity at this level. Okay, and now huge. Um, Postgres could handle really huge databases and in stock Postgres, community Postgres. But you need to be prepared to make some um, choices. Um, each installation is unique. It's, it's hard to generalize across every huge system, but the, the first thing you need to think about is, so what's the working set? If most of the data is archival, performance can still be manageable even on a giant database. The, the reason that one petabyte database was, so, was uh, manageable is actually very, very little of that data was being accessed at any one time. They didn't do a count star across a one petabyte table. Um, the, most of it was archival and it was very heavily partitioned. Now, there, this raises a question, of course, if it's archival data, why, don't, why not archive it and get out of the database entirely? Do you really need it live online in the database? So you, it's the, you can separate it into a transactional system and a data warehouse. Logical replication is great for doing this. Um, or you can consider very large scale sharding. Um, instead of one gigantic database or um, uh, closely connected nodes, you have geographic uh, or enterprise database. You, you know, give each continent a database um, or, or give each tenant a database. 
Um, and you can use multi-master tools, either custom written or the small handful that exist right now, to handle synchronization. Um, you can use Bucardo. Um, Second Quadrant has BDR, which um, is a commercial product, but it does handle multi-master replication. Um, this is also, for giant databases, data federation is also valuable. So move the um, archival data to our data stores, or even just to cold storage. Just move it to S3, you know, dump it and move it to S3 buckets and drop, the, drop, the, drop it out of the main database. Um, or use foreign data wrappers to federate multiple databases. Um, or just run big and small databases on the same Postgres instance. Perfectly valid solutions to the problem. So, in, in sum, Postgres is amazing, but we all knew that. Um, what is one thing about it is it's a single tool that can handle everything from your laptop to these world-spanning database environments, which is pretty amazing that a single tool could do that. And it will grow with you. Um, so don't go crazy with tooling. It, when you have your five gigabyte database, it's not necessary just to invest in Terraform and this and that and everything, and you're going to do everything with configuration code and all that. But it's always important to keep... Um, but it, what's important is keep one eye out for how to handle the next step. So when you have your five gigabyte database, think about how your, um, how your 100 gigabyte gig will be managed. And when you're at 100 gigabytes, think about how your one terabyte database will be managed. And that's, and that's my presentation. Thank you very much.